Great. I think you're going to see me one day in about something on energy storage, but in a different context. So we're going to talk about long duration energy storage. And the way the whole presentation is kind of framed is why we in fact have to talk about long duration energy storage. And uh, Professor Ashok Jujan was set a nice context day before yesterday on why the LDES is important at all, right? And before, so one is taking an example from outside on what we do, and the other is what we experience ourselves. And I'm going to talk about why the long duration energy storage was so important in our own context and what we experienced. First, let me start with this. So the sun and wind, of course, the intermittency of the solar energy availability, as well as the wind energy availability, forces us to really go for energy storage. But then that's a normal issue, right? If you can store for 24 hours, next day there's going to be a sun, right? At the max, you may have to store for two or three days, and that should be all right. Uh, but why the word long duration energy storage has come up is the question here. Why the long duration energy storage has come up here. And I'm not talking about few days, I'm talking about weeks, and months, even years, can we do that? And why it is important? And uh, I'll start with the story, as I've said, on our own experience. We have a building at Chemical Engineering Laboratory at IIT Madras, which is partially grid independent. And it is powered by solar panels. And uh, we are testing like various energy storage options down there. And you could see that those energy storage based on lithium ion batteries, like three, uh, four different systems. And we have lead acid batteries, zinc air, and hydrogen business. And so we have designed it in such a way that all the load, even during the winter, like especially the non-sunny seasons, I would use that way. I think uh, India definitely doesn't have a winter. It's kind of winter and rainy season together. We kind of mess up these two terms beautifully. So we kind of built like everything based on that. This was one of our flagship projects. And we're collecting like tons of data starting from the solar energy temperature of uh, the ambient temperature of the panel, individual cell performance, all the way down to the load consumption. And this is one set of data from a lithium iron phosphate battery. In June, so you can, like this is, let's look at the plot onto the left. This is a kind of slightly heavy slide. So you can see, just look at the black colored ones. Those are the actual energy generated from the solar panels. And you could see that on average, we are getting somewhere around 15 to 20 kilowatt hour. Every day, every day. That was the energy uh, generated. We consume almost all of them every day. Now, let me go on to the next one, on to the right side, October, and look at it. Now, it has come down to somewhere around 14 to 16 and even lower than that. It varies from 10 to 14 or 10 to 16 kilowatt hour per day. And even that 10 to four, uh, 14 is not our problem. And let's look at the very end of this one. In the last few days, it was raining heavily. It was raining heavily and it was extremely cloudy. Now, let me just highlight only those three points right there. On 26th October, we were generating only less than six kilowatt hour. On 29th October, uh, we were generating somewhere around eight. Again, on 30th October, we have generated only six kilowatt hour. Our requirement is somewhere between 10 and 15 kilowatt hour for that specific room, which is powered by this lithium iron phosphate battery. One thing we can definitely do is over build the system or like kind of instead of uh, just a certain kilowatt panel, we can go for a large number of panels, but that cannot be a solution. So ideally, I'll have to install, uh, like this is from the five kilowatt panels actually, what we've got. Imagine if I have to uh, like meet my uh, 15 kilowatt hour requirement, I'll have to essentially multiply that five into three, which will be 15 kilowatt panels, 15 kilowatt panels. But then in the summer, the problem is I'll have too much of energy that I'll have to dump. In, and nowadays, what you're doing is, in the summer, especially in May, June, July, and uh, August even, we are dumping the energy into our air conditioner because we don't know what to do with the energy that we're generating. It's heavily produced, heavily uh, in, in excess, even with that small amount. But then, so on one side, like almost four to six months, we are producing way in excess. And on the other side, especially in the rainy season, we literally kept the building dark because of this issue, because of this issue. This is where I felt when I have something in excess, can I store the energy like from, let's say, uh, April to June or July, and then use it when there is a serious demand, when sun is not available, when wind is not available, right? And that's where we are really talking about long duration energy storage. These four days were seriously a disaster. My team is sitting somewhere, and we literally felt we did all due justice to the design. In spite of all those things, we failed beautifully. In the, in the, during those four days when it was raining heavily, we could do nothing except keeping the building in dark. 
we were heavily claiming to everyone that even if the entire institute goes dark, this building will be bright. And then it failed on those four days, actually. Um, I think we accept the failure, but then it gives an opportunity for us to really go on to the next one. We need to seriously work on long duration energy storage because of this specific issue. How we can even do it? Yesterday I talked about hydrogen. So we split water to generate hydrogen, and eventually we can keep that hydrogen, uh, and then store it in the compressed gas, and then use it whenever we require. That's one option. Next is store in the form of solids. I'll be talking quite heavily about it today. Or batteries. I mean, electrically rechargeable batteries, you cannot keep it charged for one year and then open it. It will be discharged. I'm sure all of us have experience. You'll have a 100% charged battery, keep it for a few days, come back. Self-discharge nowadays has been like kind of heavily reduced, but you cannot keep it for one year. You will lose it heavily. You will lose it heavily. And then the next thing, pumped hydro. It's kind of uh, nature has to gift us with this specific option, uh, except you're living in Switzerland where they have too many mountains, pump all the water uh, down in the valley up in the hill, and then whenever they require, they pump it back down, run the turbines and get the electricity. And molten salt, I'll rule it out for now because it's more like a chiller thing that people talked about. We cannot store it for a very long time because of the heat losses. So I essentially rule these three out, and those are the two good options we have. And which one to select? I'll give you, start with the simple number. Yesterday, Dr. Anuradha Ganesh from Cummins also talked about it. So roughly, uh, yesterday we said about 55 kilowatt are required to generate one kg of hydrogen, but today I wrote 65. The reason is today I've accounted for all the drying and then the water purification, every other electricity consumption that has to go into producing one kg of hydrogen. And that's roughly 65 kilowatt hour. And then if you burn that, as, uh, like one kg will get somewhere between 16 to 17 kilowatt hour back. So this is kind of heavily tested. So for example, in fuel cells, uh, even Toyota Mirai, if you look at the number, you pump one kg into it, you will get roughly 18 uh, kilowatt hour max in the well-optimized system. So meaning the turnaround efficiency is around 25 percentage. Now, how to store this? Now, I'll come back to it. There's, there might be a disconnectivity between what I've talked before in the previous slide and now, but I'll, I'll talk one thing here. So I'll, I'll give a connectivity in the next slide. So as of now, let's say that if you can store hydrogen in cylinders, our CNG uh, vehicles now, uh, like they store the uh, CNG at around uh, 250 bar pressure, 200, 250, and meaning one kg of hydrogen requires roughly 59 liters. Now, um, Germany, for example, Toyota Mirai stores the hydrogen at 700 bar pressure, and India doesn't have that technology, and it's, it's purely based on carbon-based composites, and uh, so one kg of uh, hydrogen can be stored in 26 liters. But now I'll take this one. This is a more reasonable thing because we have infrastructure to really uh, cope up with this requirement. Hydrogen, this is an interesting slide that's going to set the context for me. Hydrogen, in 59 liters, I can get 16 to 17 kilowatt hour out. Now, let me take zinc, metal. I'm not talking about a gas, I'm talking about a metal. I can store, this is not a theoretical number, this is based on our actual lab data. 379 kilowatt hour can be stored in the same 59 liters. And aluminum, this is not our data based on literature, 712 kilowatt hour. Iron, 501 kilowatt hour. So is there a way like we can move out and store the uh, energy in the form of metals? Of course, the answer is yes. And that's what the whole context is going to be today. And why metals, first of all? India is the fourth largest producer of zinc. Aluminum, iron, India is the fourth largest producer of iron. And aluminum, here is a bauxite map. It's not an actual aluminum production map. And India is the second largest producer of aluminum. So we have all these resources heavily available. And essentially, the entire technology for aluminum production or iron production or zinc production and the resource is available in-house. So there is a very good chance that we really have to work on these uh, three elements. Now, the, the advantages of having metals as a storage option is the following. One, high energy can be stored in a small volume. If you know if you have a small LCV, dump the entire uh, zinc into it or aluminum into it, you don't need a cylinder, right? You just need to dump all of them and ship it wherever you want and use it wherever required. And then no cylinder required. It's non-flammable, most importantly. You don't have to compress and store it and worry about flammability. Of course, I'm not trying to say that hydrogen can be replaced uh, with zinc or aluminum or iron. Uh, there are some areas only where these things can be replaced. I'll talk towards the end. That's where the whole story, how we can use this zinc, aluminum, and iron in the system for energy production. And that's where the aqueous metal air batteries come into the play, aqueous metal air batteries. Now, how we can use it? I said store the energy in the form of metals, but then on the other side, I'm talking about batteries. Now, the story goes this way. I'm not going to create an electrically rechargeable battery, rather I'm going to create a mechanically rechargeable battery. 
where let's say that I have a discharge only system where let's say that it's more like a petrol pump. You go and then you pump the zinc into it, zinc plates or zinc powder, whatever it is. And then you discharge the whole thing completely. And then you get the zinc, let's say the metal, any metal oxide back. And then the spent ones, you just pull it out. And then you have a solar powered or wind powered recharging stations where the metal oxide can be converted back to metal. And then you just ship it back and then pump it here. It's more like kind of circular economy. We just can go and do it. And I don't think we, we, we I don't think uh, people talk about like mechanical recharge battery or old technology. Of course, it's old technology. But the thing is, it suits your requirements now. We have to really rework on this whole, uh, like whole uh, entity of this uh, uh, energy storage system, and then look at this mechanically rechargeable batteries as a holistic, uh, in, in a holistic perspective. The thing is that now, imagine I have so much of wind or sun. Let's say it's a certain period of uh, year. I can store the metal plates whenever I require. I store it. I don't really have to use it put the metal plates in the corner of the room. Whenever there is a demand, you just pump them into the uh, discharge only systems and get the energy out to meet the excess requirements. And that is where the mechanically rechargeable metal air batteries come into the play. And the why metal air batteries? I have a full length history about it. We'll talk during the lunch about that. Now, among the metals, I'm going to just rule out iron altogether. Let's compare aluminum and zinc alone. I'm not going to talk about iron. It's, it's still way off from the actual reality. So let me just quickly look at this number. The overall turnaround efficiency. For example, I put one kilowatt hour inside, and what is the X amount of kilowatt hour I can get out? Uh, I've shown that in the, in the uh, hydrogen, the hydrogen, when I put 55, 65 kilowatt hour, I get only 16 kilowatt hour out, meaning less than 20 percentage of it is coming out, 25. And uh, zinc air, we can get around, uh, in our lab, we're getting around 40. We can go up to like 50 to 60. Uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the long run. Now, aluminum air, it's very, very low. It's like just one half of it, aluminum air batteries. And I, we also did a comparison with lithium ion. Of course, lithium ion is very high in terms of the turnaround efficiency. Um, there is no comparison because lithium ion has its own market. But then between aluminum and zinc, where I want to store, we preferred uh, zinc because aluminum, the purity of aluminum required for aluminum air is very high. You have to go for 99.99 percentage pure. Zinc, any crap that you put in the corner can put it in the device and get the device running. So that's where the zinc air battery come into the play. How the whole concept goes this way. We have a discharge only system. Once you, where we have assumed that there is a zinc plate. Uh, once you discharge, you get zinc powder, right? You just ship it back and then, uh, like you don't have to ship the cylinders, rather zinc oxide. Cylinders doesn't have to be shipped. It's a small amount of zinc oxide, active metal need to be shipped wherever the excess energy is available. Convert them back to the zinc plate and then reuse it, and then it's a circular economy. We are not going to really consume the zinc here, rather it's going to be utilized uh, like, uh, like throughout the whole process. And these are like multiple versions. We started very small, and now we have really a large module in our laboratory. And uh, so the, the latest module was 1.3 kilowatt hour. Uh, wait for a surprise in three months. We're going to have a really large module coming up from our group uh, soon on this metal battery. And a lot of iterations went through, and I have my team sitting, and some of you have met them already. I have met them already, like really went through multiple iterations, build the whole, uh, the entire architecture and really fit to the needs. And the thing is that this is only discharge only system. We have also built the entire charging system as well, which I'll talk in a bit before I'll give a bit of information about this battery thing. We use aqueous electrolyte and uh, most importantly, I'd like to point you to this number. How much of energy I can store in a liter, in a volume? The lithium ion battery, the one that we have in the electric vehicles is around 350 watt hour per liter. But zinc ion battery is 500 already. This is our first prototype. It's not like kind of best optimized like the way lithium ion batteries are. And then of course there are other things. And then I would say that cost, even at the lab scale production, the cost of it is less than one third of what lithium ion batteries take. Lithium ion batteries, like just five, six years ago, they were at around $1,000 per kilowatt hour. And 10 years before, they were at $1,500 to $2,000 per kilowatt hour at the production level. And we are talking about the lab scale production, which is a single entity that we've made, and it's already the less than the cost of one third price of the actual mass produced lithium ion batteries. And so in terms of cost advantage, and we have a handful of patents, and so we do develop the prototype, and it's kind of fit to the need for the country. And there are a lot of other uh, information, I'll just skip that. And these are the two uh, bright guys who might be sitting at the back somewhere. Ah yeah, there's one there. So Akhil and Gunjan, and they are the mastermind behind a lot of these activities. And that is our zinc air battery. And then 
Uh, once we spend it, zinc oxide will be produced, and we have a discharge only system which can be connected to the solar panels at the moment, and then we can take the zinc plate out and then put it back. It's a kind of, we developed a full ecosystem. It's more like an ice cream company giving a refrigerator. Now I think we can have someone at a home, someone in the small workshops can have this recharging station and they can do the service for you. you know? It should be like kind of decentralized. Essentially, solar and wind are decentralized, so do the power generation and storage has to be decentralized, and that was our concept. And the other thing I want to bring out is it's 100% sustainable. So nowadays, whenever a mobile phone board is dead, or let's say a motherboard is dead in your computer, or a single component is gone, you have to replace the whole thing. And we have kept something in mind that if a single cell is dead in the entire pack, you cannot open a lithium-ion battery for now. Now, whereas in our system, we made it more like a Lego block setup, we can pull that one entity, throw it out, and put a new one in, and then the setup will be ready to go. The thing is, a lot of thought process went into the whole system for the design of this whole activity. It's 100% it's sustainable, and we can even replace the component level failures. If a component in a cell fails, we can even replace that. And we can literally recycle 95% of the components back. So uh, we made, we tried to work on, and we are really hoping that this technology, we could tape it, take it to the next level and then push it out to the market for the long duration energy storage. Now, before getting on, I think I would like to answer this question. Yesterday I talked highly about hydrogen, and today I'm talking highly about metals. And am I seriously ditching the hydrogen? The answer is seriously no. Hydrogen has its place. Hydrogen has to be in steel industry, ammonia industry, and heavy duty vehicles. Heavy duty vehicles require high power. Although I talked a lot of advantages of zinc air batteries, I did not talk about its power. It has a very low power system, and it fits only the stationary storage applications. It will never go to electric vehicles unless it is a low power two wheelers, or unless we use it as a range extender in the, in the trucks, for example. There it can go. Otherwise, I don't think the metal air batteries can go into that domain. Being said that, for long duration energy storage, this is the best option that we have at the moment. This is the best option we have at the moment, and a very low cost, and without any resource constraint. A lot of speakers talked uh, since yesterday that resources are always confined to a specific place. Monopoly is playing a role, I think, in, in really getting the technology out. And uh, the zinc air battery selection itself took us really almost six months to really narrow down onto it. Do we have an IP space available? Do we can create a sustainable environment around it? Can we have the resource that is not confined to a single country? Every component, we are not talking about the, you know, like the major component and missing out on key things out, no. We're talking about the entire component and, and its availability. We really spent quite a lot of time before coming out to the zinc air. And the conclusion is that for long duration energy storage, store them in the form of metals and the word green hydrogen has been around, and we talked about it yesterday also, blue hydrogen. Now we are talking about the green zinc. When hydrogen can be green, why can't a zinc can be green? And with that, I leave a note and say thanks to everyone who stayed until the third day to listen to us. Thanks so much.